Thank you all for coming today, today, 2015. My name is Amy Hodge. I'm the science data librarian for Stanford Libraries. And we're very happy to have you all here with us today. And we hope you learned some interesting and useful things at this event, which is a follow-up to the Forum on the Future of Scientific Publishing that we held in July of 2013. A few words on our program today. If you want to follow along, the program's on our website at dataday.stanford.edu slash program. We're going to start off this morning with our keynote speaker, who's Christine Borgman from UCLA. I'll introduce her in a minute. And then we're going to hear from a number of our esteemed Stanford faculty. At the break, Christine is going to be doing a book signing of her book, um, Big Data, Little Data, No Data, Scholarship in the Networked World. And we're going to be giving away a few of those as door prizes during the day today. And um, you have to be present to win. So, so far, that's good news for you. Uh, when we reconvene after the break, we're going to hear from a few more Stanford, fac Stanford faculty and the head of Stanford Libraries, and then we'll be having lunch in the foyer. So most of you probably already know this, but I'll cover that the restrooms are over this way. Go, go out um, the conference hall and take a right. And um, during the day, if you would like to ask questions of any of the speakers when we have Q&A, please wait for Julie or Tony to bring you a microphone. All right? That's, that's the end of my beginning. So, I am now very pleased to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Christine Borgman. She is the pre professor and presidential chair in information studies at UCLA. She's the author of more than 200 publications in information studies, computer science, and communication. Her newest book, Big Data, Little Data, No Data, Scholarship in the Networked World, was published in, by MIT Press in January. You can read more complete bio for Christine and all of today's speakers on our website at datadaystanfordedu slash speakers. Christine will be talking with us today about why data sharing and reuse are so difficult. Christine. Thank you. Uh, Amy was in Amsterdam in September when I keynoted the Research Data Alliance meeting and came up to me afterward and said, could we get you to come to Stanford? And I said, it's my alma mater. How can I not come to Stanford? Um, although I must say, I get up here every year or two, and the a number of buildings on this campus since I was this graduate student about 30 years ago is quite remarkably a different flavor in, uh, in the place since. Uh, but it's also exciting to be here, given how active Stanford has become, I mean, particularly since Michael Keller's been here and you know, establishing uh, the High Wire Press and the repositories. And you folks really are on the leading edge, certainly the bleeding edge of dealing with some of these issues around data sharing, reuse, and, uh, and so on. So I'm going to give you a broad tour. And this was the topic that uh, Amy and I thought would be a really good framing about why it's so difficult uh, to do these things. This month, actually sort of March, April time frame, is the 350th anniversary of the first English language uh, journal, the uh, Ph Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. There is the 350th anniversary issue uh, that is officially out, um, out next week. Uh, now, data course goes back much longer than the, than the journals do. You know, people have been observing and, and collecting evidence uh, for much longer while they were still writing letters to each other and beginning to assemble these in something that looked like a, you know, a peer-reviewed communication. Um, and yet, we're still wrestling with what, publish, what, what publishing means, what publication of data means, uh, which is rather oxymoronic in, in many respects, as I'll get through uh, as we go on. You know, the field of rhetoric, communication, social studies, science uh, will make remarks like this to say that the publications are not simply containers of data, which is a phrase you sometimes hear from the funding agencies. You know, you've published your article, just give us the data that goes with it. And it's really much more complicated than that. You know, a publication, whether it's a book, a journal article, a conference paper, you're making an argument and you're using some kinds of data as evidence. You can use different data to make the same argument. You can use the same data to make different arguments. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship, and we often find that it's many-to-many um, -many relationships between these. The open access policies, which have really spread around the world, make various kinds of relationships between requiring access to publications and requiring access to data. It's rarely in one policy. And I mean, for example, you'll see that NSF is 
requiring people do data management plans, they're encouraging deposit, but they're not establishing repositories. The Australians have been as aggressive as anyone has on this front, and they've made uh, data management part of the res uh, code of responsibility for the conduct of research for the entire country. But these are proliferating, China's developing them, uh, and the Research Data Alliance now has members from about 60 countries already. So this, of the many things that uh, could be covered, this is what, uh, you know, what I've come up with. In, in this uh, book, most of which I wrote at, um, at Oxford in 2012-13, uh, but drawing on about 15 years of work of really socio-technical work in the field in a number of different sciences and work in the social sciences and the humanities as well, is to devote an entire chapter to the notion of data. And part of what I want to convince you today that the issue is not so much big data, is thinking about what are data and the changing notions of data in the context of scholarship across all fields. And then I gradually set up a model of some of the factors that distinguish the domain knowledge, the kind of expertise, the kind of selection and collection issues, uh, and then spend the middle part of the book walking through case studies in a number of different fields going from um, astronomy at the beginning all the way through Chinese Buddhist philology at the end. Okay. And then the last part is where I wrap up the policy. So I'll be talking largely from, say, chapter eight today on the releasing, sharing, and reusing of data. So this is about as broad as we can do in 30 or 40 minutes is to think about how we might define data, some of those questions and making the data useful, um, how we make the useful data, how we make those useful, and how we keep them useful, which is the sharing, the reuse, the kinds of repository questions that the library and scholars are dealing with. So to start with notions of data. Big data is still sort of the hot topic on um, the front pages. And this is a term that nobody really agrees what, it's me what it means, other than it's got a lot of hype and it's really cool. This definition, the three Vs, goes back to 2001 from the business world, from the, from the Gartner Group. And so you can see already that there's at least three dimensions of it could be big in terms of the volume, how much of it there is, the rate at which it's coming at you, the velocity, or the heterogeneity. And those are characteristics that uh, we see distinguish across some of the disciplines by the kind of data, and all of those factors seem to, uh, seem to influence people's ability to keep it or to, or to reuse it. The long tail is another phrase you see quite a bit. This is even more reductionist. It says you can take all of scholarship down to two dimensions. Uh, we've, you know, we've only got one V here about volume. But it does uh, suggest, for example, that you've got a small number of researchers with large amounts of whatever that stuff is, and then many people spread farther down uh, this long end who have less of, of whatever that stuff is. Open data, another phrase that gets thrown around a lot. The simplest definition is that it, you don't have to pay for it. It's just out there, not a lot of license. You can reuse it. Uh, but ab access to data does not necessarily mean it's good data. And making a bigger haystack does not make your needle easier to find. Okay. So that's open data. Okay. It may be piles of stuff, no metadata. You can't make sense of it, but it's free. This is the more uh, complex definition and one that's been around for a good while now. This is the OECD from uh, 2007. And they're even working on a fairly narrow definition of data from the sciences and data from publicly funded research. So the OECD definition says to be open data uh, within that constraint, it needs to satisfy all of these things. Now, the intersection of all of those is the null set, as someone said. Okay. You're go, you, you may be able to strive for some of those, but actually making data releasable in such a way that it satisfies all of the definitions of intellectual property, uh, the responsibility in different domains, quality, security, efficiency, accountability is going to be difficult. So you're going to have to pick some of those and decide uh, what, what's important. What most of these issues come down to is a lack of agreement on what are data in the first place. When you start peeling back the layers of those policies, whether they're from the funding agencies, the journals, 
or whatever, rarely will you find a very explicit definition of data. Usually it's sort of in the eyes of the beholder, whatever you consider to be data is what we want. This, and it, so you end up with this problem of, are we looking for the final published version? Are we looking for the data set that you submitted at the point that you sent the first draft into the journal? Uh, do you want the spreadsheet? Do you want the protocols? Do you want the calibration? You know, what are we really talking about here when you say releasing the data? When you look at these objects on the screen, what are you seeing? When you see a mouse, are you seeing a model organism? Are you seeing something you put in a cage and watch the behavior as it moves around? Are you thinking about something that you can sacrifice and look at the slides? It's what you do with it when it becomes the data. Similarly, the Pisa Griffin, which is one of the case studies I have, this is an object that was sitting in plain sight on top of the Pisa Duomo for about 400 years, and they're still trying to decide what it is. Okay. It may have been made in uh, Italy, in Spain, or in Egypt, they've traced the metals to a particular mine in Cyprus. It may have been a Christian object. It may have been an Islamic object. They're not even sure what pieces of it got added when. Okay. So it's many kinds of data to, to many people working on it. So this is the definition where I ended up, is to say that it's, it's not stuff, it's not objects. It, something becomes data when you use it. It's, it's a very process-oriented definition. And this is the reason that one person's signal is often someone else's noise. That it's, it's so hard to keep, decide exactly what it is you're keeping. So it's the representations, and it's when you choose to use them as evidence for your research that they become data. Okay. Hard to pin down beyond that. So how do, we make, um, how do we make useful data? We've been working with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey for um, six or eight years now, and uh, been working in sensor networks since about uh, 2002, and I was one of the co-PIs of the Center for Embedded Network Sensing for the 10 years of that NSF Science Technology Center that was based at, uh, based at UCLA. And these are nice contrasts in terms of your big science and your more, more small kind of science that I'll, I'll walk you through a couple of cases here. Um, but first to back up to this uh, infamous 2008 um, issue of Wired Magazine uh, when, by Chris Anderson. And this was at the, so the early really biggest hype of big data saying uh, now it's all numbers, it's all about correlations. If you have enough numbers, you don't need theory, you don't need method. It's just, you know, come back later and mine it. And that's certainly not what we're seeing in any of the research that we do. Science continues to be about models and about theories. So this is, again, part of choosing what you keep and how much context you need to have around it is to think about uh, what are the tools, what are the data sources, the practices, what kind of infrastructure. I mean, Stanford is building out um, a pretty fabulous infrastructure here. Um, including all kinds of skills and expertise to make the data useful that faculty and students are um, constructing. But you know, all of science, all of scholarship, you're starting with some kind of model, some kind of theory. So to pick up somebody's string of numbers um, a day later, a month later, a decade later, if you don't know what that set of assumptions was, what those protocols were, it's very hard really to interpret interpret them and get, uh, get good value out of them farther down the line. This is a model that we did of a scientific life cycle specific to the embedded sensing work. Now, you know, every different set of science, may, science, social science, humanities, will have its own kind of model of how you work through things. But a couple of things to point out here. One is that it's specific to embedded sensor networks. Second, this is a model we build of trying to develop object reuse and exchange, a particular World Wide Web standard, to figure out how you can do semantic relationships between the various objects that get thrown off in the course of research. Third is to notice these big chunks. We at least divided up the, the research process into you know, the experimental design phases, the data cleaning uh, phases, 
and the publication and preservation. But there's many, many artifacts to get thrown out. And then we were trying to build relationships, build the links, get the context, say, how can you publish this entire set of relationships in such a way that other people can use it again? Now, documenting all of that well enough, you can reconstruct it. There's a lot of work going on in scientific workflows trying to document things. It's terrific if you can do it, but most research really looks more like this. Okay. Lots, lots, lots of dead ends, lots of blind, blind alleys, lots of different paths. People really don't document their procedures anywhere near as well as we might say in that, in that ideal way, which is also why it's hard to get back to it. In comparing the so the big science, little science, and this is you know this is an admittedly forced dichotomy. You can't again you can't get all scholarship into into two different groups. And these five uh, five or six points of comparison are only a few of ones that have been developed, say in social studies of science, that uh, we can distinguish sort of large groups of activity by um, how much investment they make in instruments what the overall cost is, how long the duration of uh, studies is, the number of people involved, how distributed the work is. But we always need some kind of domain expertise, no matter what kind of, what kind of work that we're doing. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, like other big astronomy projects, was a decade or so, um, you know, even, you know, even much longer if you consider how long it takes to get the groups organized to make the pitch, to go through the dec decadal uh, reviews of setting priorities for the funding agencies. And then it's still running, but from 2000 to 2008 was the first two phases that produced about 140, 150 terabytes of, of data. Very high quality work on the night sky and hundreds if not thousands of papers have come out of these particular sets of, uh, sets of data. So we've got really big data, but you can't use them all at once. You've got to divide them up into little kinds of pieces and do small kinds of questions. Often, you're cutting these data sets up into little pieces, and you're combining them with pieces from other areas. This uh, one from Harvard, which is you know, four pages in uh, Nature, which is all you get in the letters section, and I think another 12 pages of supplemental material because that only shows up online. So you know we got the, the scope of the publications getting messy, and then you get lots of little figures cutting up um, other other parts of it. So it's it's big data in collection, but it's often small data in the way things are actually used. So here goes the question of the you know the main data set, the 150 terabytes, that's being preserved pretty much, um, but the derived data that comes out of it gets combined, there's often no place to put that back again. That's the kind of thing that may end up back in the library, it may end up in someplace else, or it may end up um, just disappearing altogether. Uh, SENS, again, that we worked with for a very long time, looks like pretty big science when you figure you know, somewhere between 60 and $100 million went into this over the course of a decade, large numbers of people, highly distributed, but small science, uh, small science in character. We're putting uh, different kinds of sensor technology in the earth, in the field, in the sky, replacing graduate students, climbing up in trees and dipping water with stopwatches out of, out of rivers and things, um, and doing, you know, it's a really very interesting work. But one of the things that we found, there was a real signal and noise mix People would go out in the field together and take home very different things of what they assumed to be the data. And, and they could never be brought back together again later. So just for example, the engineering researchers were concerned about the stability of the instrumentation. And if they could compare today's measurement to yesterday's measurement to last week's measurement and from one device to the next, then they had data and things were working well. So one of our engineers says, you know, temperature's temperature. They're working in a swimming pool with some of their robots. Biologist, same team. Completely different orientation, does not trust the numbers that are coming from the engineers. And it's not that either one's right or wrong, it's they have a different orientation, a different point of reference. The biologists are concerned about the calibration relative to international standards for the way that biology is done. This particular fellow took uh, three different temperature instruments, 
put them side by side in isolated national reserve, let them run for 365 days before he could trust the instruments. Very different notions of, of what are the data. I mean, we see this all over the place and even things like um, Southern California and water quality. You want you know, a certain level of measurement if you're talking about drinking water, and yet the surfers are doing some very interesting uh, daily work about whether it's safe to surf. You don't want to lose that, but it's, you know, it's valid for different purposes. And we see this all over the place. If you want to look in social sciences, I picked this one because I particularly like the, um, the title of the paper about who's, who's really happy. Okay. But you, you, know, you, need, you can't just go out and interview people on the streets and say, are you happy? You, you know, you've got to have a model, you've got to have a theory, you've got to set a set of questions. If you're going to interpret these and use them again, you need to know a whole lot about exactly how that was constructed. And again, the, my uh, Pisa Griffin, uh, the person that uh, introduced me to this project is the archaeometallurgist working on it, uh, who is equally trained in archaeology and metallurgy. And he finds, so he's the one who can take the samples from the inside of this beast and get the complete composition of them. He's doing nanoscale modeling, sub-nanoscale actually. And then there's other people doing elaborate 3D x-ray modeling. They've got terabytes of data on this object. So it looked like you know, sort of small humanities research has become very big science work. But he's also finding that what he needs to trace the history of those metals is only in the conservation records, and that's not what museums make public. He's traveling around the world, working in dusty paper archives, talking to his friends who he knows has the stuff. Very personal relationships to trace the history of this, uh, to do the metallurgy work. Um, thirdly, around making, um, making data useful. We're back to our, uh, our big haystack. You know, can we chew up that haystack and put it through some kind of machine and make it, uh, make it useful? This is as good um, a list as any. Again, the Australians have been very active in this area, the Australian National Data Service, of saying, um, why is it that we should manage data and arguing about better data equals better research, and if you manage it better, you're going to get more integrity in your own research. And that's certainly the point of inter intervention that we have looked at, is if you can help people manage their own data, they're more likely to be able to use them again after the graduate student, the postdoc, and so on, has, has moved on to the next project or the next country. Um, the connecting, which is uh, publishing data often, at least in the RDA, uh, Research Data Alliance Group, tends to mean uh, just linking them together, which is you know, a questionable definition of publishing. But to make them more discoverable means you've got to describe them in ways you can anticipate future use, uh, which is also challenging, and that you could reuse them to verify claims and to go back and find early observations, like we were talking about. Uh, Roy's videotapes that were lost from the 1970s because it was just way too expensive to convert them. We've got many, many kinds of observational data we can never get again, but it's very expensive to keep them and you need to decide how you're going to do it. So this is from the Research Data Alliance where uh, Amy came uh, last, uh, last year and there's already another meeting in um, early March that was in San Diego. So we've got, this is a three-year-old organization, and part of what RDA is trying to do is bring together people from many, many different stakeholders. Uh, among the challenges here is that there's not been a forum in which librarians, scholars, publishers, funding agencies, others, could all talk to each other. And the astronomy, you know, the astronomers talk to each other, the social science archivists talk to each other. This is a place where there's finally getting some crosstalk. And you know, hundreds of people are showing up for these meetings with many working groups and very clear deliverables. So uh, it's, a, it's barely three years in. They've got another couple of years of funding. It's primarily from NSF in the US, Australia, Australian National Data Service, and uh, the European Union's putting quite a bit into it too. But to reduce the barriers to data sharing means that people are going to share their data in the first place. 
And Stanford seems to be way ahead of the game in terms of getting people to, um, to release their data. Now, this is, again, one of the things that we're working on now is, is different models of the way in which data get released. These are, um, there's at least two general ways. One is, as in astronomy or you know, areas of physics, the community gets together and agrees we're going to build a very large observatory. We're going to spend years, sometimes a couple of decades, agreeing on what we're going to collect, what the models are, what the standards are, what the technologies are, and we're going to pool these data resources uh, from the top down and then try to keep them, uh, keep them going. Although even here, it's turning out to keep them going for the long term is expensive and not necessarily well supported. In most fields, it's much more bottom up. And whether those resources end up in the protein data bank or in ICPSR at Ann Arbor for the social sciences, it's survey data, uh, they're, they're pooled later, which is very difficult to do because now you've got to agree on standards and practices and merging things that are not necessarily compatible with, with each other. Uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, like other surveys, had um, a good bit of funding to keep those repositories going for as long as they were actively collecting new data. This is the infrastructure problem. Funding agencies are not writing blank checks that they will keep the data going indefinitely after active data collection ends. So the reason that we started studying this is that they uh, made a memorandum of understanding with two universities that they would pass the data off to these two large university libraries into different kinds of dark archives or sort of semi-functional help desk uh, discoverable archives for another five years or so of funding. They've now found a way to sort of rebuild and re-engineer this, but given that Sloan Digital Sky Survey was the technology was built in the late 90s on early Mozilla browsers and early SQL. It was sort of, you know, kind of barely web technologies. It now requires a massive re-engineering to keep these things scientifically valuable over the long period of time. And we're, we're looking at LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, and they're already, you know, planning more than half of that billion dollar project is going to data archiving. It's a huge team, huge and highly distributed teams. Uh, the social science uh, surveys, the, the mother ship is, at least in the US, North America, is ICPSR, the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Science Research, which has celebrated its 50th um, anniversary. And this is, you know, you know, Stanford probably pays, you know, some, some thousands, perhaps some tens of thousands a year to be a member of ICPSR so that Stanford can contribute data to it and get data from it. But the, you know, the effort that goes in, you can now, you get the complete code book, you can uh, get the data in SAS, SPSS, STATA, and you, you know what you're getting, it's well curated and they migrate it forward to, uh, to other formats. And not many fields have that. So there's a real lack of incentives in most areas and uh, the fields that have managed to overcome these have you know, found particular community practices of ways of doing so. But we know the labor to document data is considerable. You know, some of that can be done by a library and archival metadata specialist, but a good, you still need a fair amount of domain knowledge and you need participation from the investigators and the people collecting the data. Benefits to unknown others is perhaps the biggest, uh, the biggest disincentive of if you couldn't get the value out of it, why should you spend your time and money um, cleaning it up so that somebody you've never met can exploit the data in ways that you were not able to do? Okay. And so the, the economists say this is you know, a, a real, there's a real value proposition challenge here uh, that nobody's quite sure how to get around, uh, but it's, it seems to vary from field to field about how people get around this and how they get some kind of quid pro quo. People uh, cooperate, but they also uh, compete with each other. There's questions of how well you can control uh, your resources and uh, huge intellectual property. It's, it's often hard to know who really owns it. And then if you're working in human subjects, we've got confidentiality problems, re-identification, and so on.
But there's also a lack of incentives to reuse data. So even if they are saved and we're finding the, you know, the, rate of, um, the rate of release and sharing is not that high, the rate of reuse is also, um, is also not very high. It's difficult to describe data in ways that you can anticipate future use. In fact, that's one of the things that we found that people don't release their data because they can't imagine what anybody else might use them for, much less to do a full description in such a way that you could anticipate that future use. Uh, but even if you can find it, uh, you're going to have to spend a lot of time cleaning it up and matching it to your questions. The, if you read those business books on big data, you'll get to the last chapter or so before they will start to explain, well, you're going to spend the first 80% of your time cleaning up the data before you can really match it and make it useful. And then you've got to trust it, and you're putting your reputation on top of somebody else's data. It's much easier to get a new grant to collect new data than it is to get a grant to reuse other data in most fields. So these are, you know, these are some fairly intractable problems that we're, we're working on. And it's not just that you want to retrieve it, you want to know what's in it, you need to know uh, how you're going to use it and how you can compute upon it and so on. So this is where um, it gets also nasty in terms of thinking about the relationship between publications and, uh, and data sets is publications are, you know, at least you can, if you've got the four corners of the document, you pretty much know what you've got and you should be able to read it intact where to make sense of the data set, you need to have uh, more of the protocols and such around it. The data citation is another real challenge here that, um, you know, who should you be attributing? We, uh, Jillian Wallace's dissertation out of um, my group started with the question of who's an author of the data? And it turned out that the word authorship didn't really resonate with most of the people that we were studying. It's okay, we, we can negotiate authorship on an article. We're not sure how we're going to negotiate that on a data set. And do you want to give credit to the PI who's going to have the longest address? But if what you want to know is how those data were collected and handled, it's usually going to be the grad student, the postdoc, the person been in the field that you want to talk to. You know, do you want to talk to the inst instrumentation people? Do you want to talk to lab tech? So we end up with these very long lists. It's something other than authorship. And you'll see journals are moving in that direction of contributorship and asking for fairly precise listings of who was engaged in what particular aspect of, of research. So we get into ownership and responsibility questions that also are not, not yet clear around, around data as far as sharing goes. Metadata, um, well known to uh, librarians and archivists, and you have a number of metadata specialists here, uh, but the metadata specialists can work with the people on the ground, but you still got to have a good bit of uh, domain expertise to work with a metadata specialist librarian to decide what you really want to do. And it's not clear how much expertise uh, most investigators are going to be willing to invest in this. Uh, in the work with, uh, with SENS, we were trying to help them with, in areas like water quality and, and biology, mm -hmm. and we brought them things like the um, environmental markup language that said, you know, it looks like a good match for this work. And then we said, okay, great, we'll, we'll try that. And then we handed them the 200-page manual. And that was end of discussion right there. Uh, because the 200-page manual is intended for the librarians who are going to run the center and invest in, you know, long-term about a particular kind of data. It was built for things like the long-term ecological research centers. Uh, we went to the big compilation of water quality uh, ontologies was being built by the San Diego Supercomputer Centers. They were merging all these water ontologies. And they said, fine, let, let's use that. I said, well, there's 10,000 terms in there. Okay, well, that's not going to work. Okay, so let's look at nitrates. We found 400 terms on nitrates. There's just is a real granularity disconnects here that you've got to find a way where you've got the right level of granularity, the, the right scoping for the particular project, and that's going to contribute to the interoperability issues. Um, similarly, provenance is something that libraries, museums, archives are familiar with 
And it's, I mean, it's difficult even for physical objects. You think about things like the, the piece of griffin. You know, we can say it's, you know, it's been on top of the Duomo for 400 years. But where it came from, you know, where that physical object came from before that is not always easy to say. You know, the Getty is having its, its wonderful um, you know, wars with Italy about what it's going to give back and the you know, Cronox and the um, Norton Simon. But it's, uh, these things have many pieces to them. And when we talk about digital objects, you're, you're tracing every single little bit and pulling them together. So we've now got some standards coming out of the World Wide Web Consortium. You know, they're not cookie cutter things you can just drop in, but at least we've got some standards, some practices, some protocols, some ways to, uh, to look at those pieces and, and pull them back together. But to reuse data, you really need good provenance information of uh, where things came from. So lastly, and this is you know, coming back to some of the library issues around how do we keep those data useful for a longer period of time. These are questions that uh, probably librarians and archivists have asked for a long time. Archivists like to say that their users haven't been born yet. Okay. We're a long way from saying that around digital data. So are we talking about trying to keep these useful for five years, for 10 years, or for several decades? And the, or, you know, I think the farther down this list you go, the more, you know, the more labor we're talking and the bigger the investment. So each community needs to think through what level of investment, who's the audience going to be, and, um, and for how long. Also, most of the practices around archiving tend to focus on communities. I mean, community itself is a pretty fuzzy term. But people you know, are part of one community. They go on to another, another, another over the course of their careers. The collections may last longer than the communities that built them. And you know, the libraries, the universities are going to be the institutions that outlive the communities. So we've, we've got to figure out what the level of gov governance and coordination is here. And who's actually going to do it and what kinds of skills? Now, and Stanford's launching later this month another big, uh, another big data initiative, and it's going to work more around the data scientists. Uh, data science is a, one of many encompassing terms that, at least the way it's usually being used, it's the labor at the, at the front end of the process. And it's also being used more in the business and government and world than in the, the research world, although the big projects that the Sloan and Moore Foundations are funding are also looking at data science at those earlier stages of the process. Uh, people have very strong computational statistical expertise to do the wrangling, do the cleaning, do the pipelines, do the processing, as opposed to ones who come along a bit further down the line. So you know, certainly we need this set of skills, but this is not the same set of skills that goes with the curation and the stewardship if we're going to keep them and, and make, them, make, make them useful. So this is where um, Amy and Julie and you know, Mike's large team here are working on building those services and tools, assisting faculty with planning for data management, uh, the selection and appraisal processes, just helping decide what's, you know, what's worth keeping and how and why and for how long. And keeping it once isn't good <laughs> enough. It's a continual reappraisal and deciding, you know, are these good for five years, 10 years, and so on. I mean, even the climate models tend to be kept for maybe five years or so, and, and, and you reach a point where, you know, do you really want to migrate them, or has the technology and so on changed so much? It's time to just let them go and go on to the next ones. Okay. How many how many people have come across the notion of pie-shaped people so far? A, a couple of you. Okay. So it's it's been around for a while, but say you know what we need is scholars who are not just domain experts, but also have a fair amount of computational expertise to complement really exploiting the data in their fields. Uh, but I would argue it's now much more than that. It's there may be a third leg, and we don't. There's uh, the people at the University of Washington are talking about gamma-shaped researchers now. Uh, but we need, you know, we need to get a third leg in here somehow, where people start to think about their data as data, to think about what the value lies in it, how they can exploit it, how they can reuse it, 
uh, I mean, we've, you know, again, we've been interviewing scientists and other scholars for, you know, 15 years or so, and you, you know, you talk to people, kind of warm them up, get a sense of their research, and then you ask them, well, so what are your data? And you get this really head-scratching response. People don't think about their data as data, as a thing, as stuff as something that, that is, has a life of its own that they should curate and maintain. So it's getting that, the part of what the stages we are now is getting people much more sensitized to what, to what they have and how they might be, might be using it. So that takes us to the, the libraries and the knowledge infrastructures, and this is from our good colleague, um, Alyssa Goodman, in Harvard Astronomy, where she puts our, our Vermeer in the middle and says what you need is, is your, your publications, your library on one side, you need your data and your tools on the other and your literature and have this big, beautiful piece, um, which we, we need all of that, but it's really much messier than that. It's, uh, and this is a report that we did a couple of years ago now with funding from NSF and Sloan. Talking about the changing, the changing stakeholders, the changing kinds of infrastructures, uh, the unfunded mandates. Uh, you know, what part of this are universities going to pick up? Libraries, funding agencies, um, where all the different partners live, and um, and how things are going to to shake out. And this is a time we need to think about how they're going to shake out. Uh, but it's it's string, it's bailing wire, it's old technology, it's new technology, it's it's various other uh, various other pieces. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to discuss the economics at, in, in any depth, and you know, we can certainly talk about those. I know Mike knows the economics as well as anyone does around questions of, of governance and, and you know, where the investments are, are going to be made in the sharing and the reuse. But just to note that you know, we've got large numbers of data repositories out there. This is the Directory of Open Access repositories, which includes article repositories as well as data repositories. But a couple of things about this slide. One is that uh, the U.S. is less than 20% of all those repositories. Now, the U.S. is not investing at the rate that other parts of the world, particularly Europe, are, um, is investing. Uh, and also that most of the repositories are funded themselves as three to five year grant projects. I mean, some get renewed and some of them don't, but a whole lot of these repositories go dark. And even things like some of the, the support for data management planning tools and so on are starting to go dark. The Arts and Humanities Research Service in Britain went dark in 2008, and it really changed the you know the flavor of the community. You spend you, know, you spend years getting community buy-in, and then an archive goes dark, and it's going to take a long time to build trust back up again after people have made those kinds of investments. Um, so we need to think about how we're really going to get that that kind of buy-in. Okay. So to wrap up on um, conclusions is try to talk through the challenges of defining data and how one person's signal is, is another, person's, another person's noise. Uh, we need to think about making useful data. It's not just crunching numbers. It's about models and questions and methods and how we're going to bring the expertise together. Uh, to make those data useful, you need to know a lot about them. Those strings of numbers aren't very helpful by themselves and different expertise. And then lastly is we need to think about that infrastructure development, which, which Stanford certainly has, investment in the people and um, investment in the trust fabric. Because you know, re data sharing and reuse really come down to, to, questions of, to questions of trust, and trust among collaborators, trust among the data sets, trust among the institutions. And you know, if, if the library is going to be the memory institution, this is important role for libraries to play as uh, memory institutions around data, which are getting lost at a prodigious rate. So thank you. Questions? Yeah. Um, let's wait for Julie really quickly. Uh, thank you. That was really fantastic. Uh, I, I did have one question, perhaps more focused on the incentives for the individual researcher. 
And so, for example, uh, John Ioannidis of the Stanford uh, Medical Faculty has written a paper, most published results are, are wrong. Right. <laughs> and so you figure most Stanford medical professors are writing things where they think, you know, chances are good I'm wrong in what I'm writing, in which case the last thing I want to do is give my data to anybody else. <laughs> or maybe I'm right, um, in which case I know that somebody has an incentive to prove I'm wrong, and therefore giving them the data makes it easier for them to maybe muck it up in some mm -hmm. way that makes it look like I'm wrong. So the incentives are not to share, and, and this is very much my experience, in the, certainly in the medical profession, that nobody wants to share their data, and they don't want to say that because that makes you look like you're a very self-interested and, and not public-spirited uh, academic, so they create a lot of other reasons why it's costly. But I think that, that the fundamental dynamic that drives it is, is that motivation. If you're an assistant professor, you want to be able to make sure that you're not proved wrong until you get tenure. Or <laughs> if you're going for a prize, you want to make sure that you're not disproved until you won the prize. So the incentives are so great not to share that institutionally it seems like the the academic, uh, uh, you know, world has to create much more of a strong impetus that you don't get any credit for anything until your data is shared, and that other people get to take a look at it. So just just a thought. Well, the difficulty, I mean, I, I agree with everything you've said because that, that's certainly what we see, is that. The notion of right and wrong is, is simply not absolute. And this is, I mean, and the climate researchers have found, you know, what happens when you start cherry picking somebody else's data to make it look like what, whatever you want it to look like. Repl you know, re people, you know, reproducibility, and you know, you get these numbers, only 44% are reproducible, blah, blah. But, you know, are we talking about reproducing back by going out in the field? Are we talking about the same data set? Are we talking about verification, validation? I mean, just th that notion is huge. There's a, a famous uh, set of studies in um, history of science by uh, Harry Collins about gravitational waves. And one group of scientists only trusted the experiments that showed that gravitational waves existed, and the other group only trusted the ones that said they didn't exist. Okay. So, you know, these, these are epistemological arguments, and putting the data set out there is not going to resolve the epistemological argument. Okay. And so that, that's part of why I keep coming back to the data aren't stuff. And it's, you know, that, that we're, we're trying to reify them as truth, where it's much more about the argument and the way that science proceeds. Oh, sorry. Hi. I'm going to take you into a little bit different dimension. Uh, I work in a molecular imaging lab, and if you look at breast cancer as an example today, somebody has a mammography, a radiologist looks at some abnormality and just says, is that cancer or not, basically. Um, today, or someday in the future, what we're working on is, has the capability to monitor a tumor, almost like real-time video for the three-month treatment at 100,000 frames per second, all 100 million cancer cells in the tumor. For every cancer cell, what biomarkers, such as estrogen receptors, HER2, or other things like that, where's the cell relative to a blood vessel and everything. Mm -hmm. Just framing the problem, let alone how do we get it into some kind of clinical, meaningful data that somebody can look at and decide on a diagnosis or treatment for a patient, just boggles my mind. <laughs> I don't know if you've got any suggestions on even how to start with that. I, I hope we can do it. It's clearly very important, but it's, I mean, but once, even once you figure out how to frame it, um, you've got to document it and explain, you know, there's that deeply tacit knowledge that what they call magic hands at, at you know, at the first stages of research of the second person can't come along with the same mouse and the same, you know, reagents or whatever and be able to get the same result because there's very fine level technique is, you know, science proceeds from that magic hands to something that's more kit-like that you can carry on. There was a, a well-known study in Britain about 10 years ago, early days of e-science, on the e-diamond project about trying to distribute the reading of mammograms. Do you know that study? Yeah, I can um, you know, point you to it later. 
but they found that there was so much there was so much craft in the way people read mammograms that it was very hard to distribute that work from one place to the next. So it's also about you know how much you can codify of that that expertise. But you know, you're the domain experts, so back to trying to craft that problem. But but if you're thinking now about how you craft it in such a way that you can share that method and share those data, then you're more likely to get that dissemination. So more power to you. Hey, thank you very much for the talk. It's a lot of questions and a lot of problems you outlined there. And I think the most problematic one was the lack of reuse. Um, and, and that kind of poses the big question, like if we put so much effort in this very, very hard problem of data sharing, mm -hmm. um, and we struggle to get people to reuse the data, maybe we should be better about uh, promoting the, you know, the, the good cases of mm -hmm. data reuse. And maybe we should be also trying to get better at predicting which data sets have higher reuse value mm -hmm. than others. Because blindly getting everyone to share is very, very expensive. Right. And we just cannot afford it. I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts mm -hmm. on that. I mean, certainly, one of the things that we're trying to study and other people in more the communication, social sciences, is to look for you know, what cases work and what cases don't work and, and, and what are the exemplars and, and what's, what's special about them. And that's one of the interesting things about astronomy is they have this long history of, uh, of making data useful and other people using it for, for long periods of time. But there's, but there's particular things about the way that science is done that don't seem to transfer very well. And there's been a good bit of work in, in genomics, and that's an area I don't know as well yet, as, but we're starting to move into some of those. But there's you know, areas about, you know, genomics was among the first, and there's a long political history around how people agreed up front um, to share those data. But there's, you know, it's, all, it's still going to be contentious because, you know, are you, share, are you building those repositories so that you can mine and compare across large um, sets, or are you keeping them to avoid doing it again later, where the, the technology, I understand, in genomics is changing so quickly that a two or three year old data set is considered old news, that you're better off taking the sample and running it again on new equipment. And so that argues against keeping the, the, the back files. But if you don't keep the back files, then you can't do that large mining and comparison. So I think it's also thinking through exactly what we're keeping and why. But the question of anticipating future use, that's the library and archival question of millennia, is things that were, you know, things that were not useful become you know, useful later. The, the beekeeper's manuals in the 19th century are suddenly incredibly important for climate change. And at least we kept them. But we can't keep everything for, for serendipitous reasons. This follows on the on the prior query, and that was um, mm -hmm. uh, organ people in organizations keep things for symbolic reasons, at least as yes. much for instrumental reasons. And I think libraries are kind of a, a paradigmatic mm -hmm. instance of that. And uh, it, you've been talking about uh, data preservation, I think, primarily in terms of instrumentality. And I'm wondering if you could talk also about this other side, the ceremony side, and if there might be a way in which if we acknowledge that a little more explicitly, we might be able to make different kinds of decisions. Excellent. We should definitely, I mean, things like, I'm looking at this gorgeous uh, Carlton Watkins sitting here of, of, you know, of why we keep things. And, you know, in many respects, Saeed Chowdhury said a few years ago that data are the new special collections. And for Stanford, the deepest data collection in X, Y, or Z is a way to attract people to the university. The Australians talk about a small university in Tasmania that collected you know, the best set of resources in a particular kind of climate change. And by showing off what they had, they started attracting research money and graduate students and moved up, you know, moved up the ranking throughout the, you know, the symbolic value as well as the instrumental value. And yes, and certainly uh, people in the library and archival field could say a lot more about the symbolic value than we have. And you're right, that today I focus more on the instrumental, but I think we should emphasize that too. Thank you.